Welcome to the Generative AI Innovation Incubator session on medicine and public health. I'm so excited to uh, bring you this today um, because uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I uh, know that our panelists are representing a wide range of areas within this space. And we have been talking together about how to use this time most uh, productively. So I think it's going to be a great uh, session. I, I just wanna make a couple of announcements before we start. Um, registration for our hackathon on education and the future of work is open already. It continues to be open. And now we're opening up the one for medicine and public health. Um, these hackathons are meant to be a way to get community members together to work on projects to start to invent the future of generative AI. And um, so there are processes for uh, joining in and starting to form a team and doing the ideation. Um, find out more at our website. We would really like to see many of you uh, get involved in these. We have some upcoming talks I just want to highlight. Um, some of these are new since some of you registered. Uh, Eric Shing, who's one of our uh, panelists today, will also be coming back to give a talk on June 23rd. Um, and this will be uh, entitled From X-ray Crystallography to AlphaFold to Generative AI, a Renaissance of Empiricism and Connectionism in Biological Science. Then on June 30th, Manuela Veloso will be giving a talk on AI and finance. Um, and she's coming to us from JP Morgan, um, and she'll be talking about innovative examples and provocative discussion. And then finally, on July 14th, Jill Fane Lehman will be giving a talk on separating truth from fiction in generative AI. And she is not only an AI researcher, um, but also a speculative fiction author herself. Um, and she'll talk about uh, you know, some things about her book, and I'm sure that you won't want to miss that. I also want to point out we have tutorials. People are coming to these uh, presentations from many, many different sectors, some of whom are pushing the envelope on what's possible with generative AI, others who are trying to learn about it and get some um, coaching and mentoring in that space. Uh, tomorrow is our first tutorial, but we have three instances of these tutorials. They're all the same. So you can come to any of these and I encourage people who would like to get some hands-on experience with um, large language models and generative AI to sign up on our website. So uh, this community is really a conversation. We want all of these sessions to be very conversational. Um, we want to engage the audience. Um, so we look, we're monitoring the chat for questions and we will respond to those, but we've already been collecting ideas and thoughts and questions from the community. And as we looked over those that have been submitted so far that for this session, they fall into three different areas, applications, hopes, and concerns. And that cuts across the different interest groups. We have a very diverse group of members of our community from different sectors within this space. And we're really excited about the different perspectives that are coming together from these different sectors. They represent different lenses on the um, issues. And one reason why we have made these panels a centerpiece of our work as a community is so that we really have a way of bringing different perspectives together. And so I think you'll notice our panelists don't all agree with each other. We don't have one message that we're pushing out to the world. We want this to be a space for conversation. We want to get the ideas on the table. We want different sectors to talk to one another. And we value all of these lenses and the perspectives that they bring. So today, um, you can see we have a diverse set of panelists. First, Akanksha Naik comes to us from the Allen Institute for AI. Um, and she specializes in generalization in natural language processing. Dennis Newman Griffiths um, comes to us with expertise in responsible design of AI for health and medicine. And he is a professor at the University of Sheffield. Then we have Radha Mahalcha. She uh, specializes in NLP for social good from the University of Michigan. I've always really admired her work. So I'm so excited to have her here on our panel today. Min Xu is one of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon University. He's from our computational biology department and he represents 
that perspective of application of large language models in this broad space. And Eric Shing, who comes to us jointly from our machine learning department and computational biology, but he's also the president of MBZU AI, the first AI specific university. And so we're excited also to have him here. Uh, we started at Carnegie Mellon right around the same time. So I consider him almost like a brother. So I'm excited also to have him here. Great. Okay. So now I will um, have each of our panelists spend some time introducing themselves um, and to tell you a little bit about the perspective that they bring on these issues before we start the formal panel, which will be more uh, interactive. So we'll start out with you, Akanksha. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm Akanksha. I'm currently a research scientist on the Semantic Scholar team at the Allen Institute for AI, as Carolyn mentioned. And the Allen Institute for AI is a nonprofit organization which aims to leverage AI technologies for social good. Semantic Scholar, or S2 in particular, uh, aims to develop AI-powered research tools that can accelerate scientific discovery and progress. Um, specifically, we are focused on trying to build technologies that can help researchers or scholars identify papers that are relevant to their research and discover them, then use those papers and determine which of those are most relevant for their research through various kinds of features that we provide, like AI-generated TLDR summaries of these papers, and then read those papers uh, more efficiently using things like our augmented reading interface called the semantic reader and derive insights from them that are useful for their own work. One particular field of science that semantic scholar as a whole, and I've personally been really invested and focused a lot of my attention on is biomedical literature. And this is a question which has fascinated me both during my thesis research and beyond. That is, we have these huge uh, collections of medical information which could be biomedical literature, which could include online medical forums, which could include expert curated resources like WebMD. How do we structure all of this information and organize it in such a way that it's easily digestible for a broad audience of uh, people, ranging from clinicians to lay people who are actually experiencing and going through all of these diseases themselves. And I think like everyone on this panel, as well as in this audience, since the advent of large language models, one thing that we've been constantly thinking about is how do large language models actually fit into this ecosystem of medical information available online? And this brings me to the point that I hope to make on the panel, uh, which is that LLMs as we know them now are not reliable medical information providers yet but we can think of them as librarians that are guiding us to or summarizing the right information for us. And the reason why I say that LLMs are not reliable information providers yet is because they lack two features that are really crucial in a healthcare setting. The first one being attribution, which is the ability to identify where a particular fact or a snippet that the LLM is spouting out actually came from and being able to cite the source so that people can actually go to it and look up because you're not going to take medical advice if you don't know where it's coming from. And the second is contextualization, which is the fact that large language models often don't really have the complete context that a person is in when they are uh, thinking of a question and asking it or the specific point in time at which they're asking that question. And of course, there are um, ways to mitigate both of these things, especially the latter, because in the chat style interface that ChatGPT has, it could ask you probing questions and elicit answers from you that help it understand the context. But what we've seen in our studies is that LLMs increasingly just tend to give you generic advice instead of trying to tailor it to your needs specifically. And the thing that we've been thinking about a lot is that large language models, even if they're not um, ready to go solo in providing medical information, they can actually do well if they're given assistance from all of these existing uh, information collections like Semantic Scholar. And on the flip side, large language models can actually really help us make our information collections more digestible and browsable. So one particular project at Semantic Scholar that I've been focusing a lot on is trying to structure information available from clinical trials and make it very easy for people who are pressed for time in the clinical care system, like practitioners, clinical researchers, et cetera, to 
quickly browse and understand it. Um, so the way we are doing this is we're taking a lot of uh, abstracts and biomedical articles, identifying key numeric results from them and trying to develop visual abstracts that can quickly give people a bird's eye view of the results from those um, articles. And we're also trying to expand this to a lay audience, which is sort of work in progress through various things like providing augmented reading interfaces that can give you term definitions and other relevant domain knowledge that you might need to understand a particular study, as well as plain language summarization, which can actually give you high level insights in language that's more suitable to your current level of expertise and understanding in the field. So yeah, again, really happy to be here and looking forward to hearing from all of you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Akanksha. Next, Dennis Newman Griffiths. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm also I'm also very glad to be here and, and glad to be talking about a really important you know, range of topics with this. So I'm uh, Denny Newman Griffiths. I am an assistant professor of data science at the University of Sheffield in the Information School. Um, so I bring a, a kind of combined technical and social sciences approach to thinking about AI. And my research covers a few different areas that intersect with this idea of, of AI in medicine and public health and, and raises questions about generative AI in this space. So I think a lot about, um, and I, I study the ways that data and data science interact with disability and how disability data is gathered and materialized and, and worked with in AI processes. Related to that, I, I work a lot on developing sorts of practices and principles of responsible AI. And so some of my research at the moment is, is thinking about how we can approach AI methodologies in a way that's really tied to the ways that we design and use them. And you'll hear that coming up in my thoughts in, in a moment about generative AI. And I work as well in uh, kind of thinking about pathways to implementation and pathways to uh, translational success. So using health informatics, using AI technologies in a way that is not just applied, but is really use inspired and driven by the complexity of real world situations, which can often include lots and lots of, of fun ethical challenges in you know, fun in quotation marks here, you know, related to health equity bias, understanding what those mechanisms are in AI. So thinking about generative AI in particular, you know, the, the, the main thing that I see and the, the sort of main position that I will take is that what we want to talk about is not replacement with AI, but augmenting with AI to deliver better and more human care. So, and I, I'm emphasizing human there because human is the, is the key element of delivering effective healthcare and effective use of an ethical use of generative AI can help us to get there in a way that we struggle with right now. So one of the really big problems in medical care at the moment is the issue of documentation burden, the, the requirements that are imposed for writing really extensive notes and documentation for insurance, for reimbursement, for, for care transfer purposes. And this is certainly something that generative AI can really help with by simplifying and improving that process of writing notes, of writing text, giving an initial version that a provider can start with and, and work from and, and improve and allows, then allow providers to focus on spending their time with their patients, caring for their patients in a very human way. Part of the challenge in this as well is that the sort of time crunch in medical care and some of the sorts of data processing crunches really limit the kinds of communication that we're able to use right now. So we struggle to get good information on patients' health experience on the experience and the challenges of their carers uh, and to share information between patients, carers, providers, all the various people who are involved in the process of healthcare. And this again is something where generative AI can really make a big difference with some of the things that Akanksha was talking about, summarization, reframing, capturing it and transferring information to people with different perspectives. This is an area where there can be a real difference from using these technologies. But part of what comes with that, thinking about the medical context, is really context-driven evaluation and auditing and management of these technologies. So in the medical setting in particular, there are high legal and moral and professional standards for delivering accurate information and for delivering information that informs and drives forward care. And this is something where you know, we know generative AI 
technologies are fundamentally statistical. So they will produce something that is likely, not necessarily something that is true. There are also really important considerations about data security and information security when you're working with very sensitive health information. And this is something that it is very much an active area of development in the generative AI sphere right now is how do we implement effective data security protocols in this sort of complex sphere? So part of what I am calling for in the field is that we need research beyond the technology sphere, thinking about the combination of AI and human factors. How do we bring AI into clinical workflows? How do we understand the way that it's impacting how people use and understand and work with health data? And how is it impacting the way that people work with each other in the process of medical care? That's great. Uh, I, I hear so much resonance between your very many observations and statements and the kinds of observation statements and questions that our community members have been submitting. So I think that this um, will be very well received and will spark a lot of conversation. So thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, next, Radha Mahabja. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to, to be here and join all these amazing panelists. Uh, I've known some of them and glad to get to meet some of the others. I'm uh, Radha Mihalcha. I'm a professor at Michigan, and I work primarily in natural language processing. And the reason I say primarily is because I've always been fascinated by the connection between NLP and other areas. Uh, so, for instance, I've been also working in multimodal processing, so that will mean language plus vision or plus uh, physiological sensing or um, acoustic signals um, and also the use of NLP or possibly NLP plus other modalities in other areas such as computational social science or, or healthcare. And the general focus that my uh, students and I have is in this, I would say broad area of NLP for social good, like really actively thinking about how the technologies that we develop um, have impact on, on society. And I think there is, um, in general, what I've been thinking is how in what we do, a lot of times we assume there is a one size fits all, uh, which is really not quite true. We are obviously all quite different, including say, if we just take the few of us here on this panel um, or the audience that we have today, and so what I've been pushing for is moving away from one size fits all to creating technologies that account for the people behind and in front of the language. And um, this, I believe, very much applies to this space of generative AI for healthcare. Um, just to go a little bit deeper on what we've been doing in my lab in um, NLP and healthcare, we've been thinking about mental health and how that is expressing language. Uh, for instance, we had the work that we've done during COVID to try to understand the impact that COVID had on people's mental health um, by modeling lots and lots of data from various groups um, and trying to make projections as to how uh, mental health will continue over time. Uh, we also have a lot of work in natural language processing for conversations for counseling purposes. Um, not trying to replace counselors by uh, banane means uh, to Denise's point. So it's really not going after replacing human expertise, but rather augmenting. So thinking of how NLP can help counselors uh, by giving them feedback and in a way really bringing the expertise of thousands of other counselors at their fingertips so they can themselves um, get better. Uh, we've been also working on misinformation detection, which is really broad and I think very much apply nowadays when we talk about generative AI, uh, but also specifically we've been thinking about misinformation in the space of healthcare, uh, where the, they are really very high stakes, right? So it's um, having some misinformation spread in healthcare can have really big implications. Um, now, when it comes to what I think would be exciting areas to consider uh, for generative AIs um, in this medical space and public health. Um, right now, a lot of the models that we see are rather generic. Um, I think if there is a lot of room for building language models specifically tailored for healthcare, 
which will not only include useful medical knowledge, but will also be robust and trustworthy. Um, and Akansha emphasized that as well. So the need for having trustworthy systems. Um, when it really just comes to medical knowledge, I've been speaking with people in the medical profession and they tell me where we have up to date. So there are systems already sort of there, Google specialized on medical expertise. There isn't really any specific addition that these systems would bring. Um, but the value would come from being able to provide information that would be trustworthy and also the connection that would be made across, um, across pieces of information. And um, I also think there is a lot of value in conversational systems. And here I can see, for instance, providing help in dealing with some difficult issues, helping people think ahead of, say, a medical appointment of questions they should ask or what kind of issues to think of. Um, kind of like patients like me, so being able to draw analogies across different situations, like medical situations that people are on. I think there is a lot of room for that. There is also, of course, the big, big space of electronic health record processing. Um, some immediate tasks which were mentioned before would be, say, summarization or information extraction. Uh, but I think there is also a lot of value that could come from drawing connection across such health records and information that we have, for instance, in research articles and being able perhaps to make some suggestions on um, say differential diagnosis or what could be some possible triggers um, or symptoms or other things. So adding value to what's in the health record through generative AI um, can, be, can be very helpful, especially if it's trustworthy. And finally, I would mention also a place where I believe um, NLP and especially these generative models can make a difference is in providing a training environment for people in medical professionals, in medical professions. And with that, I think across the board, so I mentioned briefly training of counselors where they would get feedback on counseling sessions they give. Uh, but I can also see that for, for instance, for physicians, for nurses, for nutritionists, for people who provide physical therapy. So really across the board, kind of lifelong learning, um, that will be a lot of value that could come from this system. So allowing really us as humans to get better with the help of these systems. And I'll stop there. Um, Great. And I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. And especially the work that you have done um, in the mental health space. Uh, some of our community members have submitted questions and ideas from that perspective. I think that there, there has been a lot of sort of visioning about where these large language models might fit on that landscape. And I'm so glad that your deep expertise in that area will be, will be represented on our panel. Min Xu, next to you. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, th thank you so much for your invitation, uh, and I'm really excited to, to be here uh, to attend this panel. So uh, basically, I'm a assistant professor in uh, our computational biology department at CMU, and uh, I specifically work on this biological image analysis, and uh, we, we design this computational methods to uh, analyze a particular type of uh, biological image called cryo-electron tomography, and uh, it is uh, the highest resolution 3D imaging technique for the intact biological organisms, and it reaches kind of nano meter uh, resolution, and it, it consists, it can visualize a lot of uh, different uh, diverse uh, subcellular structures. And uh, this uh, field is a very important field that, that connects to the uh, structural biology, cell biology, and system biology. So uh, yeah, so I guess uh, most of our community members are not uh, very familiar with the uh, field of computational biology. So I'm going to give a short introduction of this field uh, according to my understanding. So basically, uh, in this field, we study living organisms, and uh, these living organisms are extremely complicated. So, for example, uh, the human body consists of uh, 
maybe trillion, 70 trillion cells, right? And uh, maybe either human cells or microbial cells. So, and uh, each mammalian cells, right, could comprise uh, millions of protein particles. Right. So, so we often have this level of uh, complete, uh, tremendous amount of uh, information that we ha have to handle, right, in order to understand the essential machinery, right, of these biological organisms, and um, so, so if, to understand such a, a kind of complicated uh, and a tremendous amount of. Uh, the information, right? We will have to rely on the uh, computation, especially AI, and uh, therefore the integration of AI and uh, and computational biology actually have a relatively long history, right? And back to 1991, right? A group of uh, AI experts started a workshop, and then which evolves later on to a conference called the Intellectual. Intelligence systems for molecular biology, which turned out to be one of our two major conferences in our field, and uh, and nowadays, uh, so so with the fast accumulation and of the biological data, and uh, also the fast uh, increase of the complex city of the biological data available, right? So we are increasingly rely on the uh, advance of uh, AI technologies, right? To handle, to analyze such data, to help our biologists to understand uh, um, our specific uh, biological objects of interest. And uh, also uh, computational biology itself uh, is also a, a very important driver to push the advance of the AI domain uh, in general. And uh, so for uh, as for my specific research, this generative AI is particularly uh, used for, for the an analysis of these uh, structures and the shapes, and especially these uh, subcellular structures, and especially these macromolecular structures, because um, we could uh, have training data of these structures, and then we use these generative models, generative AI to uh, capture the distribution of these uh, structures, and then uh, map this distribution into a high, high dimensional uh, Euclidean space, and then we can do the statistics. So this is, uh, we have done some preliminary work in this domain. And another uh, very useful um, tool, right, especially, for example, in chat GPT, okay, so so they are particularly useful for our computational biologists in uh, to help us for this coding automation. So basically, uh, in this computational biology domain, we often have to write uh, these short scripts to handle different kind of data processing and data analysis tasks. And uh, these short scripts are very redundant, but uh, it's very difficult to reuse. So uh, that's why having this uh, chat GPT to generate uh, uh, the coding samples will actually pretty helpful right, for us to uh, increase our uh, efficiency to uh, write such scripting. So so that's uh, uh, the basic input. So Thank, thank you so much, Min. That's great. Um, and finally, Eric Xing. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me, um, Caroline. And also, it's great to see uh, such a spectacular pan panel of specialists uh, who already give a lot of background knowledge in NLP and in computational biology, which I'm not going to repeat. So yeah, as uh, Caroline just mentioned, I'm a professor of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, in the past uh, uh, two decades, I've been working across several different areas, but primarily focusing on machine learning and the statistical foundational methodology in theory, aggregate and system. But also uh, I do use these methods to uh, uh, solve a few NLP, computer vision and network related problems. Uh, also, maybe uh, helpful for this panel, you know, I used to be trained as a molecular biologist uh, so I had a PhD in molecular biology before I become a computer scientist. Therefore, my area also includes the 
application of a statistical methodology and AI technology for problems in statistic genetics, you know, in computational genomics, and in analyzing medical images and uh, electronic health record and so forth. So today, uh, I want to join this panel uh, by offering a slightly different angle uh, from uh, what is uh, typically viewed from uh, NLP specialists and uh, computer scientists. I want to kind of uh, push toward uh, uh, AI for a social good into a narrower kind of uh, setup where uh, what is known as AI for science. And also I want to, on the other hand, expand the approach from a large language model toward what is known as a foundation model. And I'm going to give you a context. You know, scientific problems are different from a social problem because, uh, for example, using language as example, we know a lot about language. That is uh, basically the very means of our communication. We know the sentiments, you know, uh, the, the, the semantics and the, the bias and the toxicity and, uh, you know, all these uh, human related factors. But uh, in a natural science, such as biology, uh, we actually know very little, you know, about, you know, the biological conditions of our organism. Therefore, to put a human context into that, to me, is uh, quite premature, because uh, the way to understand biology is uh, rather uh, preliminary and also rather uh, objective at this point. Um, using, for example, uh, the AlphaFold you know, uh, tool program as example, right? It is uh, solving the protein structure problem from uh, protein sequences using an approach that is uh, completely different you know, from uh, a typical physicist or biologists that used to work on either based on first principle, you know, or use uh, reverse engineering, you know, of uh, a uh, X-ray image, you know, uh, shined through, you know, the molecule. It is using some very abstract and uh, connectivism approach based on transformer structures and also based on multiple ways of uh, doing geometric projections and distillations of the information into some latent space where information can have an uh, interest in dynamics uh, in interacting and distilling and uh, revealing some of the uh, previously unseen nuances you know in you know sequence to structure implications and that's a way different from uh, a typical human ways of solving problem and uh, but is this a problem you know in science I guess not because uh, for them if you want to take a, uh, a aviation uh, experience, say you want to fly from somewhere, you fly to there, it becomes your goal. The way you fly them is less relevant. You don't want to fly as a bird or as a human. Human don't fly at all. Therefore, it is uh, really a goal-driven solution. And I think the foundation model, you know, uh, based on attention mechanisms and based on transformers and based on this uh, heavily parameterized deep architectures is kind of like a, a semi-black box tool that gives you the solution you want or make the prediction you need you know, from uh, a complex input using a less well understood mechanism in a very empirical uh, based uh, intuition and uh, some very heavy computation. So this is not a typical way that we humans solve problem. But in here, if your goal is to solve the problem in biology, uh, the desire to make them think like human, a behavior like human becomes uh, less of a priority. So I want to just uh, point this out because this is uh, not the same in our case for producing chat GPT functions and other you know, consumer oriented functions. And this is uh, something I found to be fascinating because uh, if you find yourself to be you know, uh, putting discovery and, uh, and also uh, maybe even function-driven applications for prediction as a main goal, the scientific vehicle and approach may be different. So talking about the healthcare, there is one aspect which relates to compliance um, and uh, maybe uh, communication and the uh, interpersonal relationship, policy, safety, trustworthiness, and so forth. But uh, 
on the basis of that, there is uh, the fundamental predictability and understanding of biological behaviors. And biology, as uh, Mingxu just mentioned, is an extremely complex system. They started from atoms to molecules, you know, to macromolecules like proteins and to networks, and then all the way to cell, multiple cell tissues and organs and organisms and then communities of individuals. Right now, all this information, because of uh, the complexity and also the amount of computing needed, basically was studied in a very siloed way. That's why you see biological departments, medical departments, and, uh, and maybe uh, public health departments, each take uh, a particular uh, kind of a fraction or silo of the data and uh, look into them using classical tools. But uh, the arrival of the foundation uh, foundation models and the LLM like approaches is uh, suggesting the potential of uh, building extremely powerful and large size models that can consume all these models in the holistic and the multi granular fashion. And that actually brings me to be uh, becoming very interested recently, you know, to revisit many of the problems I used to study using this kind of a new approach. So what I'm presenting today or representing today is kind of a, a prelude of the talk I'm going to give in a few weeks to kind of uh, uh, cast some new insight or reflection on how to uh, do biological research uh, in light of uh, the arrival of uh, massive amount of data and the massive uh, uh, amount of a compute and potentially new architectures that can be used to study data and distill knowledge differently. And uh, also, of course, you know, understand the mechanism in such a way that they can be conducted in a safe and a trustworthy fashion. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Eric. And we definitely did get um, submissions from people asking about the role of generative AI in doing science and new discovery. And so uh, we'll have opportunity to push even further on some of those ideas now as we move into um, our uh, more interactive part of this panel. So um, looking over the kinds of uh, contributions that community members have been making uh, as they have been participating in our Slack discussions and also responding on our surveys. Some applications of generative AI have come up, um, some in terms of medical imaging and generative imaging in particular. Um, there have been um, people talking around the idea of, you know, will this technology increase the ability to um, automatically detect disease in medical images, and also what might be um, new um, applications in the area of generative imaging. Uh, people are talking in a, 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 about automated clinical documentation, and this came up also in some of the comments that Denny and Akanksha had made earlier. Um, uh, an, an area which I did not hear any of our panelists raise yet, um, that came up was treatment planning support, interactive treatment planning support. Um, and, you know, do we trust uh, generative AI to be involved in treatment planning support or what kind of scaffolding might it be able to productively um, contribute in that? I think this touches some upon what Eric was bringing up and, and maybe also uh, Min, um, but drug discovery and development, is there a role um, for generative AI in that space? Um, or related to the treatment planning, medical advice or information access, certainly um, in um, a conscious comments about a, a librarian, um, there's ideas in there, but maybe among our panelists, there are some different perspectives. Emotional support, I think, connects up a lot to what Rada was mentioning, but, uh, you know, this harkens back in my mind to, uh, you know, the past, um, uh, you know, um, uh, chatbots um, that where there were, uh, you know, some downsides to people trusting a, a chatbot too much or for it playing a sort of dysfunctional role in um, emotional support. And I wonder what you know, across our panelists, people think of this issue and also um, management of clinical trials or patient identification. There's already been some application of machine learning in that space, but are there new opportunities there? So with just this um, uh, beginning smattering 
of, um, of an application landscape. I want to um, now um, open up so you can see all the panelists pinned to the top of the screen here. And let's go ahead and uh, hear panelists interacting with one another. And, and I will be also looking um, at the chat. I see there has already been quite some discussion there. Who wants to jump in first to comment on some of these application areas further from what you have already uh, commented? I think Dennis, I go right in. ahead. Yeah, I can hop in because I, I'm I was interested by this last idea that was brought up of of like clinical trial eligibility and patient matching because I think that that actually highlights an an interesting area where the sort of limitations of the current approaches mean that it's probably like I don't see it being very useful there. I think I, I see a lot of utility in a lot of these other areas, but like patient you know evaluating patient eligibility for clinical trials is a brutally difficult logical problem. It's about identifying like what is the evidence that is going on with this person. There's a lot of temporal reasoning, reasoning. there's a lot of numeric reasoning and, and saying like, can't do they fit these structured criteria? So I think where it could help is, and could actually be really useful, is in helping to analyze the criteria that are set in there because they're usually described in natural language and it's really hard to match them to like logical forms. So that's somewhere where it could help. But I think there's, you know, the kinds of reasoning that are required to do the task are precisely the kinds of things that like large language models right now just can't do. I think you raised um, one really interesting tidbit that might not have been the main point of, of what you meant to say, Dennis, but you mentioned about the natural language uh, being hard to match up to uh, like formal logical representations of meaning. And uh, one of the questions we'll come back to later to comment on further is, in what ways are the desire to apply generative AI to new application areas likely to push the technology forward by raising challenges, enduring challenges in the field? Um, so will this place these um, technical challenges more front and center for the community. What what do people think? I think we have many computational linguists around the table who may have uh, differing perspectives on this issue. Well, I can add a little bit to that. I think there is um, there is already some interesting work, and in fact, we've seen that even in the past, prior to generative AI, in the space of active learning, where getting technology pushed into difficult areas can actually lead to progress. And in the past, it was really seen, for instance, in active learning where maybe multiple systems would disagree and that's where we'll seek help from uh, people, right? So here as well, I think it's important to identify the areas where these systems would fail or maybe not be very trustworthy and either seek help from human expertise or what I've been seeing in some recent work, what's referred to as self-alignment, where you push the technology in areas that are not even supposed to know. So for instance, you ask them to generate things for 2026. We are not there yet, so how would they know? But by pushing it there, then it starts coming up with some, um, generation or surfacing the areas where it will need more knowledge or more input for it to start functioning better. So that's a way of almost like self-improvement or improvement with some determined help from human expertise. And I believe there is a lot of potential there, really finding that space where humans and AI can work together in productive ways. Yeah, that's very interesting. Also, I know that uh, there's been some work on um, being able to detect known versus unknown. And I think, um, you know, many people raise the issue of hallucinations with generative AI. And, um, you know, so these kind of applications just highlight the importance of being able to detect known versus unknown in order to be able to harness the behavior of generative AI and, and to make it safe to know when not to speculate, uh, you know, because currently um, there are lots of places like that that, that are problematic. If I may make a comment here. Um, yes, sir, go right ahead. Yeah, 
the difficulty for us to have a discussion here about uh, LLM's application in healthcare or in any area is that academics right now don't have accessibility to the best technology and resource. In fact, you know, I think uh, GPT-4 come out, GPT-3 come out as a surprise, and GPT-4 is a bigger surprise. The issue we talk here, lack of reasoning ability, hallucination and all that may actually be go away in the next GPT. That's very possible. You know, uh, especially in my own capacity now as a university president, I do have the opportunity to talk to some of uh, the actual insiders of those technology. You know, two days ago, I actually met with Sam Altman and he was uh, talking about some of the projects that is going on, right? So in a sense, uh, academic need to also think a little bit more uh, carefully and maybe, uh, maybe uh, more uh, visionarily about uh, what's our role in the context of uh, this language, large language model era where you know, a resource data uh, and capital you know, are not universally evenly distributed and how we do the best thing we are very good at. For example, I can offer a few uh, maybe um, personal kind of uh, insights onto that. There is a lack of distinction right now in discussion about what is intelligence and what is knowledge. If we're talking about knowledge, all the medical literature, everything ever recorded in writing, you know, uh, in civilization, you know, it is happening now and maybe uh, very soon will be comfortably subsumed, you know, by a large language model or a large foundation model. That's probably a fact that we don't need to be even surprised. So if you are seeking uh, a chart or a language model for knowledge, I'm sure that they are going to be very, very competent. Even if they are not now in a certain few areas, they will become competent very soon because uh, that's a very you know, uh, obvious goal. Emotional con intelligence solving problems is a different thing. For planning a treatment is uh, uh, very situational, very contextual. It requires maybe a good word model in addition to the language model. And that's where maybe there are real opportunities for academic to offer new insights. But right now, I feel like the discussion isn't stratified enough to expose where are opportunities that is truly original and uh, open, where are just leftover small tedious work you know, that you tune it, you fine tune it, and you prompt it in whatever way to get the little functions out of it. Right. So I think this is where uh, there are a lot of space, you know, for active debate and the academic and the industry need to see, you know, a bit more uh, alignment on that. Uh, then talking about uh, uh, the other dimension about uh, AI for science, um, somehow it is also mixed with the discussion of uh, AI for social goods and also AI for uh consumer and the user uh, receptiveness. In fact, I'm now working in the Middle East for a while. I can start to understand that uh, even the very alignment that we do, for example, in Silicon Valley or in Pittsburgh will be badly received. In Europe, for example, French people are not very happy. They actually use the word uh, cultural imperialism already toward a US-based large language model. And then Middle East also have, also have their, but these are very, very, uh, how should I say, you know, a specific problem which actually can be solved rather readily once you have the right conversational data, you have uh, the right effort, you know, uh, putting into fine tuning and alignment without even using the large resources, right? So there's a clear division, you know, of uh, uh, the work, uh, but who should do that uh, and who are best at doing that? Uh, it appeared to me like uh, not very clear. What I feel like uh, something that can be easily done by you know uh, commercial you know entities uh, who are driven by you know a commercial success and the social uh, you know uh, success you know uh, probably are in a better position to work on this problem. But the academic should actually feel a little bit uh, less kind of uh, uh, carried over by these kind of uh, near goals, but to pursue maybe a more fundamental. Uh, research uh, issues that are not biased, you know, or uh, heavily distracted or influenced by many of the transient and contextualized societal concerns.
Uh, you have raised a huge can of worms there, and I think it would be great for us to spend a little bit of time talking about the relative role between industry and universities. Uh, uh, one, I think one angle on all of this that I, I didn't hear you raise, Eric, um, but that I'm hearing in my own um, world uh, among academics is, um, on the one hand, there was a big fear at first that uh, universities were losing their space because companies had access to resources that we don't have. But there are also ethical questions about um, kind of like uh, deferring completely to that world for the future of this technology. And, and so I wanna just put that concern and question on the table too. And I'd like to open this up to the other panelists. It looks like Dennis really wants to jump in, Dennis? I, I do, I do. Eric, Eric you're, you're touching on subjects that are that are that I feel very strongly about. Um, I, you know, it's it's a really, really great question. The, this, you know, focusing on the focusing on the, the question that you raised about the sort of relative roles of industry and academia. And I think for for my part, I see two really like major and very important directions that academics are still really, really, really well positioned to focus on even amidst the sort of resource inequities that, that we're dealing with at the moment. One is thinking about how we're used, like how we use these things and, and putting them in more of these sorts of cross-disciplinary contexts, the sorts of conversations that we're having today, you know, you touched on and, and Min, you touched on like bringing AI into the, not necessarily bringing AI into the biological context, but bringing them together. And mm -hmm. In Arata, you talked about bringing bringing a lot of other sorts of understanding in, in the mental health domain. You know, bringing that together with AI. I think that sort of understanding of like how do we situate these technologies and how do we interact with them and use them in complex and, and like boundary crossing ways. That's a really really important area for us to be talking about a lot more than we are. And I think that's something that academics are really really well situated for. The other side, the, the other part of it, and I think this, this is something I'd love to hear, Rada, your thoughts on, is, you know, we tend to talk about AI technology is always about getting bigger, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and we're, you know, we, that's obviously continuing. But I think as we move into this more sort of practical applications of AI and, and these being usable tools, we also need to think about smaller, not in a model sense, but in like a tailoring for smaller situations. So how do we take these sorts of foundation models? How do we take big complex technologies and really tailor them to understand, here's how we can work with this information in this context with these people. And I think Rada, some of the things that, that you're working on that you were talking about are really, really great examples of working along those lines and not necessarily needing huge kinds of technological resources to be able to make substantive technological change and social change. Rada, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, and yeah, this is something that's really close to my heart in the sense of having technologies that are adjusted to whatever we are trying to solve, as opposed to, again, assuming that there is just one thing that will solve all the problems and everyone's problems. And I see two main things to it. One is the actual knowledge that's in there. So tailoring for that, so in knowledge or information and some of what Akansha was mentioning before as well, I think it's, um, it's really relevant. So what can you bring in that will make the informational content more relevant for a specific application, whether that's mental health or maybe handling diabetes or anything else we could think of in the medical space and beyond. And then the other thing, which I really think is it's, it's big, is considering the people who are interacting with that. And we often kind of dismiss that, I mean, not even thinking that maybe somebody who was raised in, say, East Europe would have a different way of maybe trusting medical information or how they deal with such technology. Um, so keeping that in mind, the differences that we have, which are 
really fascinating. And I think we should preserve that as opposed to just assuming that everyone will interact in the same way. Um, that is that's also very important. And that goes beyond knowledge. So it's more in terms of, say, what would people need in terms of uh, from these tools, um, whether it's some cultural norms or some ways of interacting or ways of expressing confidence and, and things like that. And I think there is a lot of room to, to go there and to touch on an earlier point, difference between say academia and industry. I don't really see industry very interest, interested in going in that space of really accounting for the entire society's needs. It's more accounting for the people with the money because they will pay for this technology. So that's really a space where I think academia can make a big difference, thinking of the world at large and the needs that different people have. And I, I'm personally very, very excited about that. And I think there is a lot of room to really make a difference. I think those are great points. It raises um, another dimension here, uh, I, in, uh, or at least the interplay between some of the comments that Eric has made and that uh, Dendi and Rada have brought up. And that is that on one dimension, there's where is the locus of concern for different kinds of concerns, but then there's also where are the resources and in some ways, um, you know, the, uh, there's an obvious difference in terms of the amount of compute that's available to a huge uh, money-making company versus a single university. However, um, I am old enough now to remember a time in language technologies before benchmark tasks and shared resource data sets were the norm in which you know, a person or small group of researchers were, you know, working on their own more or less and then coming together in small conferences to share their research to today where we can't imagine doing our work without pooling resources and creating these shared large data sets to train on for benchmark tasks. And um, that was, of course, um, supported by several funding agencies that enabled that kind of community building. Um, do we see hope uh, from the university side of building these kinds of shared resources to address the differences in resourcing between industry and academia that would allow universities to continue to be major players in this space, um, you know, without that being kind of, you know, a struggle on the university side. I think uh, there is definitely a need in our community for some kind of uh... Uh, alliance and realignment. If you look at the, the society in physics, for example, you know, high energy physics, astrophysics are definitely not the business for an individual scientist. But uh, from very early on, uh, physicists already formed their coalition and they advocate for building synchrotrons, you know, uh, accelerators, and many big equipments to be shared by international community. But now there is another cultural difference that we have to overcome. You know, the other day I've been, you guys all may have the same experience. I talk to your students, what they tell you, they will tell you my project or one of my projects so on and so forth. And not even talking about anything bigger than their own projects or larger projects. But the physicists, a uh, hundred of them, maybe if you look at the uh, engineer, a thousand of them can come together discovering a single particle. And they have that kind of, uh, Kind of a humility and also that kind of a drive to work together and put 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 down the ego and then work on bigger problems. So I think at least that part can be solved by ourselves. You know, re-educating our own students and ourselves to realize that if we truly want to solve bigger problem, then we need to say the same voice and agree on one or two bigger problems to solve together, and then go together, ask for the money. You know, when you yourself ask for money, you get a million, if you're lucky, get two or three million grants. But uh, uh, if you're a hundred of us go and ask together, you will get enough money, you know, say maybe a hundred million to actually buy or, you know, uh, acquire, you know, a cluster large enough for the community to use. Of course, there's a policy issue, but that's kind of, we can learn that from the physicist. Everybody wants to use a synchrotron, but the, you need to write proposals. You need to kind of get reviews and the form teams, right? So these some cultures right now do not exist yet, you know, in our AI community. We, we, we are, you know, solo heroes and the one-man army kind of culture, you know, a lone wolf culture, you know, the people are taking pride on writing single author papers in places and so forth. 
So uh, I think that things can change. I'm very optimistic that uh, with this kind of pressure you now from the industry, we probably have no choice but to really, really think about the way we do research and then learn something from the industry where they actually team up like you know a single man or single woman working on larger problems. I think we can do the same in universities. That's great. Uh, I'm all for collaboration. Anyone who knows me uh, knows I love seeing that. Uh, there was a, a call in the chat for Kangsha to comment, and I saw the hand. Go right I ahead. I actually kind of wanted to jump in because I think uh, in this like academic industry divide and tension, one place like AI2, uh, just generally nonprofits, open source communities, can play kind of a bridging role because at AI2 and also at other places like Ulithar AI or Hugging Face, people have access to a lot of this compute and we are really excited to collaborate with people. And coming to Eric's point about um, physicists, a lot of physicists focusing on a huge collaboration together, I want to point out that the Hugging Face big science effort was something very similar to that. So it was a community of around 600 NLP researchers who focused on trying to build a 175 billion parameter model similar to what GPT-3 was at the time. And they had so much buy-in from so many different universities, so many different uh, places. And that's, I think that's kind of one of the answers. It's not the answer. I think it would be helpful if academics also united and had, a, I don't want to use the word coalition, but I guess had a group that could uh, petition for bigger budgets and more resources that could be shared across people. But I think we're already starting to see a lot of traction from both the open source community and these smaller nonprofit organizations like AI2. We have our own ongoing LLM effort also, which um, we'd be really happy to invite people to collaborate more on. That's wonderful. I love hearing that, Akanksha. Um, uh, and uh, I think it raises the question, what are the so sort of social organizations that will facilitate us as communities moving forward? And part of the reason why we started this um, innovation incubator was for the purpose of having those discussions and bringing people together to start those kinds of movements. And so I, I, I strongly encourage people to take uh, the, uh, advantage of the opportunity to raise those ideas and to, um, you know, take some leadership in this community. I'd be very happy to hear people say what kind of roles they thought, you know, we could have emerge and, and join forces um, in all of this uh, discussion. Uh, did any of the other panelists want to jump in on this issue? I'm seeing a lot of um, activity in the chat. Let me just um, look to see um, what we can start to um, ad address from there. People are, are making connections to some of our um, previous discussions. Somebody um, brought up the, so we were talking at the moment about industry versus academia, but around the table, we have other stakeholders. And I note that many of our community members actually are coming from a policy perspective. And of course, there have been questions about the role of policy from the technology side, but then there's also uh, you know, policy on the side of medicine and practice. And I wonder where those worlds come together. And um, so I note that some of our uh, community members have raised questions about um, where uh, we trust uh, or where, you know, what, what should be the policy on how this kind of technology can be uh, incorporated into medical practice and medical research and innovation in the medicine space in general. Um, and uh, I wonder if anybody wants to comment on uh, their uh, ideas or interactions within their own spheres related to these issues. I can offer some random thoughts. I don't really have an idea. It's a very complex space, right? In, in a sense, it's uh, somehow paradoxical. You know, policy requires uh, compliance and also uh, standardizations and also uh, uh, some restrictions. But uh, in software engineering domain, you know, uh, in our CS domain, you know, we champion uh, free exchange, you know, of uh, ideas and results uh, in the form of open source, code and the weights and data and so forth. 
you it's hard to get both sides of the coin uh, to simultaneously show up or to be kind of equally kind of uh, embraced. There has to be a balance. Um, maybe the first thing to uh, to maybe steer the conversation could be set up a distinction between uh, which I often kind of has been advocating these days, the difference between fundamental research and also product research, right? You regulate products, you regulate utility, but uh, you don't regulate the science itself. At least that's how I understood the difference between science and the uh, production. Um, uh, but right now, the conversation going out there is not very helpful. It's all under the big banner of regulating AI which is uh, a little bit heartbreaking. You know, I never heard a statement about regulating mathematics, for example, or regulating physics, even though, you know, you have nuclear bombs, you have, uh, you know, chemical weapons, you have uh, biological materials and transgen transgenic things. Yeah, we regulate transgenic material, but we don't regulate genetics, right? So in a sense, right now, there isn't a suffocation or there isn't a nuance, even in the, you know, narratives of discussing policy. So I would say we researchers uh, probably need to rise uh, for a uh, constructive and educational conversation with policymakers to really uh, define the uh, uh, you know the 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 the, the, the rule I mean not the rule but the the, the maybe uh, the uh, the map or you know the agenda of the conversation or maybe even the terminology of conversation so that it can be carried over more productively and. Uh, less destructively. That's so interesting um, that uh, uh, how, how you're thinking about that. But I um, you make it sound, in a way, like it's clear what the distinction in AI is between science and application. But I feel that in computer science in general, the, those lines are fuzzy. I, I have a hard time knowing where some of the work that we do sits on that landscape. Um, and I think one reason why in particular about generative AI, those questions uh, become so important is because of the differences in time scale between spheres. How quickly does policy change versus how quickly does real science happen versus how quickly is the technology ev evolving uh, before our eyes? And it's because of those differences in time scale. And I hear some of the chat also around the speed of innovation in this particular space um, that makes us kind of confused about where we should stand. We don't want to be left behind, and yet we have concerns. So, what do panelists think about this issue? How do you draw the line between science? and products, you know, between the research and the practice and, you know, then whose purview is what? Um, and, and, and so where does policy have uh, some, some, some real stake in this? And should some of this be exempted from those questions? Um, a, a whole bunch of questions there. Who wants to jump in? It looks like Dennis has his hand up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. So I, I've been actually having some conversations recently with people in the policy sphere about, about this. And, you know, they they don't really have better answers than we do, uh, as much as that would be nice. But I think, you know, Eric, what you said about both terminology and the idea of like regulating AI being analogous to regulating physics, I think that hits on a really important distinction that also speaks to this question of like research versus products. I mean, you know, in, in the sort of AI and, and world and in computer science more broadly, there's a lot of what we can think of as like use inspired research that really merges the two. And there's some, there's been some really good writing in the um, sphere of like research on research about understanding these different kinds of research uh, methodologies and what they mean for kind of inter interactions with engineering and so on. But you know, I think when when we think about the the policy perspective, it comes much more down to this sort of confusion of when we say AI, there's the sort of core AI technologies. There, there's the technological things that we build, and then there's the ways that we put, that we put them into practice, and the ways that we think about. Okay, this is a thing that I want to do. I'm going to turn it into data, 
in some way, which has lots of decision, you know, implications, how you decide to do that. And then I'm going to feed that data into an AI, AI technology and, and use something that comes out. That, I think, to me, that's where the real importance for thinking about governments, even just beyond, pol like beyond policy, thinking about governance practices really sits at that question of how are we working with technologies? And that, I think, is, is A, going to change a lot less quickly than the technologies themselves and becomes much more a, a much more of a potential place for intervention in being able to say this is how we can distinguish between good and you know harmful uses and, and situations in which we're using AI. Mm -hmm. Any Other panelists? Uh, go right ahead, Rada. With full credit to Ray Mooney from UT Austin for having, I mean, I heard first from him this term. I think one difference between AI and math and physics, which I think it's a great analogy is thinking in terms of other disciplines, but AI currently has been termed as big science, which means is the science that requires a lot of resources to build something, right? So to the point that we are there, I think regulation has a different meaning, right? So it's one thing to say, regulate every single person who can think rightfully about math or physics, it's another to regulate a handful of companies which kind of have the helm in their hands and leading the world. So there is a distinction there. I see some of it changing already with all the um, different things we've been seeing in open source, which I'm very excited about. So kind of putting the helms back into sort of people's hands. Um, so it will be interesting to also see how regulation will play a role when we don't have just say a handful of companies and then that close connection that Caroline you're pointing to like between science and product but more like open source right so open source brings a whole, whole lot of new interesting things right so it's not pure science but it's not product either so should we regulate open source I don't know um, so that's yet another point yeah, I That's think kind of the dangerous thing. Yeah, you never, you know, you uh, even the same people who advocate regulation. When you touch upon how about uh, we regulate open source, you see uproar of objections or anger, right? So it's very hard to reconcile many of these uh, conflicting, you know, uh, interests and uh, ideas. But I do want to uh, maybe uh, suggest uh, uh, again. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, a different angle, right? Don't underestimate human beings' ability to. Uh, to learn, to improve, and also to adapt to uh, an imperfect world. In fact, I remember uh, when uh, GPT 3.5 ChatGPT came out, uh, the first week people are overwhelmed and shocked and, and so on. After two months, I, I found more people, many people start to feel, oh, it's also, it's okay. And uh, and even for the AI images being generated from uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, yeah, at, at the first sight, you get, again, overwhelmed and shocked. And then after a while, you know, you actually, you know, get used to it and you actually could even tell apart the true ones from the wrong ones. So that's the way human civilization evolved. If we look at, for example, in the 14th century, the emergence of the printing press, you know, the, the churches, you know, were actually devastated by the arrival of the printing press because what, everybody got a book, a Bible, they can read by themselves, and I lose my authority of interpreting the Bible. That was kind of a shockwave they raised. And then there were all methods of uh, suppressing, banning the printing press. And some country actually succeeded, but many countries in West Europe didn't succeed. And you can see the consequence after, of course, there are consequences, you know, religious war, and, uh, but we also see Renaissance, Enlightenment, and many other things. Eventually, the people gets empowered with more knowledge. Yeah, there are disinformation. You cannot, in, in fact, we didn't check whether the book has every word spelled right. We didn't check, we, we choose to trust, but when we bump into one, we probably can recognize it, right? So I kind of see this uh, generative AI as uh, a larger and newer version of the printing press. It's about bringing knowledge to you more easily at your fingertips. Yeah, there are risks over there, but I'm optimistic that uh, civilization and mankind, you know, will extract more good out of evil from it, just because of the enlightenment that they receive, you know, from this uh, big body of knowledge. This is like the internet, you know, and the many other recent, uh, you know, uh, other historical inventions. 
uh, that's kind of how I want to offer a new angle to see it. Yes, there are any technology has a downside. And this one, uh, because it's so vastly accessible and become the spotlight, uh, there may be a initial overreaction. But uh, uh, let's see, you know, uh, in the course of time, you know, uh, I can imagine there are many other priorities. For example, you know, the climate threat probably is really an existential, existential risk than AI. People will be rethinking with the more knowledge made available to them. Uh, I really appreciate that perspective, Eric, because I think exactly the um, the the view that there was a lot of overreaction around the world um, and concern about the possible negative ramifications of that that sparked um, the desire to have this series of discussions. And I'm glad that you have this positive perspective that ultimately we will land on the positive side of that. And I hope that's- And also, I am I was a biologist, you know, in biological world, you know, the coexistence of a virus and the healthy body is actually essential. If you put someone in a super clean, you know, room, you know, to grow up, he will be very vulnerable to anything when he walk out of that room, right? So you, you we, we, we are by design living in an imperfect world to adapt, to evolve. So, so in that regard, I kind of see this to be such a example where the good outweighs the bad, but we cannot claim that there are no negatives and maybe there are severe exit, but it's probably not to the point of uh, we need to really ban it or we declare a, uh, a, a global emergency you know, uh, for uh, severe reactions. It looks like Min would like to jump in, Min. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I'd, I'd uh, yeah, today's discussion are very inspiring and I'd like to also share some random thoughts. And I feel this topic, uh, basically, uh, I, I would say this is this fundamental research, scientific research, especially in natural science. So we, we do research, uh, essentially it's, it's curiosity driven, right? So we want to understand nature and understand the life phenomena. And uh, for example, or, or understand this cognitive science, understand where this intelligence come from so so it, yeah it's largely a uh, character stage driven uh, on the other hand product product uh, so uh, people build a product i i feel it's mainly uh influence driven and right? so so yeah so so that, that's why there, there are different purposes and there's different motivations probably this could be distinguished uh, used to distinguish these two sides yeah it's just uh, some random thoughts yeah yeah, I'm I'm glad that we are are, are raising oh, oh oh Dennis, why don't you go right ahead? Uh, and you're muting. Yes, I, I got that. Um so th this actually this was not a response to 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 Min's um point. There there was a there's a question in the chat that I really wanted to bring up. So okay. Carolyn, had you wanted to respond to Min's point before we centered that question? Sure. Okay. Right so just just because you know we we kind of started this talking about the, the policy question, there was a question in the chat that I think is really relevant, um, asking uh, about privacy law and data ownership in implementation. And I think, you know, because we're thinking in this in this panel about like medicine and public health and, and thinking about biomedicine as well, like these are really important parts of the discussion that we haven't that that I think I'd be really curious to hear other panelists' thoughts on. I mean, you know, coming from the the clinical sphere, thinking about like health informatics working with clinical data. There's huge questions of data privacy for any kind of data analytics work, even for like quality assessment programs in you know in hospitals. You, there's a lot of requirements around like who can see what data for what purposes and so on. And I think the sort of infrastructural models that we have right now for how to work with data in AI are very driven from the sort of early days of the internet of everything goes. And that just doesn't work when you try to port it over into, you know, areas with much more sensitive data. And I know, Min and Eric, you know, in, in the computational biology world, like, there's a lot of debate going on right now about intellectual property of, you know, cost, like engineered DNA sequences and, and that sort of thing. So I guess I, I just wanted to, to raise that as saying, you know, I think that's a really important question for us to talk about. I don't really know what what the answers are in terms of privacy law and data ownership, other than we really need to be talking about it and we need to be getting 
I think legal legal experts, legal scholars, legal practitioners into those discussions to explore how we hammer that out. Yeah, I can totally see that happening. I haven't been aware of a lot of those ongoing discussions, though they may be happening uh, without my knowledge. I do recall, and in my mind, I, I, I compare this whole kind of craze about generative AI to the rise of the massive open online courses. And at that time, there were some similar analogous concerns and a lot of um, uh, organized discussions between different sectors, including uh, legal and policy and education and researchers talking about this, these privacy concerns and how we were going to navigate that space. And also perhaps um, there uh, was work done in, in, in that context that can be um, that can be absorbed here, um, that can also inform um, these ongoing discussions. I think that you were, was that the question from the chat or was that still your response to Shu, Amin? No, that, that, was, that was the question from the chat. Great, because I think that that's a great segue to some of the space of concerns that uh, were raised um, by community members um, privacy and information security was indeed at the top of the list, and it has come up many times and in this comment from the chat as well. Um, but bias and equity concerns were raised to some extent in the earlier comments, but, um, but we haven't talked about it um, and in as much depth as we have just explored the privacy and security um, issues. And I want to bring that back into um, the discussion. Um, there has been some, and even in questions that were raised um, earlier by community members. There's this question of, will this technology drive us more towards standardization or more towards personalization? And are these at odds with one another? And how do these connect up with those bias and equity issues? And also in terms of safety along these lines, and there are also these questions of explainability and understandability. And, and that I saw was also raised in the chat today. So this is kind of a space of concerns. These things relate to policy and regulation. Um, the, they also relate to what's possible and what's really going on. And I wonder what many of you from your own unique vantage points have to say about these, this whole space of concerns. Well, I can start. Go ahead, Dot. Yeah, go let's ahead. Wada and then Eric. Go right ahead. Yeah. I feel there is more happening right now towards standardization rather than personalization. But ultimately, I like to think that it's up to us as people working in this field to take it one way or another. Right now, these systems that we see out there are really not necessarily representative for everyone's views or backgrounds. Um, there is also some quote unquote erasure of some cultures or beliefs um, with the idea that whatever works for the majority would work for everyone, uh, which is by and large not true. So right now we really don't see that, but I think there is a lot of potential and we're, there are some efforts in that direction. Like for instance, this technology, which I actually quite like the adapters where you can take say a large language model and you put an adapter on top. And depending on how you build an adapter, you can then take it in a direction that will be more suitable to a community or another, and maybe addressing certain points without necessarily having to rebuild the whole big thing, which might not be feasible, whether it's financially or for other reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And the one thing that I keep thinking about is what I've been hearing along the way when prior to generative AI, the technology is just growing the gap between those who have and those who do not. And so keeping that front and center in how we are thinking about it and making sure that we are not just, even if we move away from standardization, we don't do it just again, differentiating between those who have and just making it finer grain at the top of that hierarchy, but really just keeping everyone in mind, which of course would involve a lot of engaging people, not only in terms of data, but also in terms of actually technology development and, and things like that. So I'm optimistic. Um, right now I see it more as a standardized way of thinking, um, but I think there is a lot of potential to actually personalize. And just to end there, I'm sure other people have things to say, 
when I say personalized, I don't think necessarily like in creepy way, like going after like one individual, uh, but more like entire groups, right? So representing entire groups. Um, and yeah, even that also I think solves some that. privacy things controversial where people stand on like at what level should personalization happen in uh, medicine. And so I uh, uh, hope people will jump in. Before we transition to Eric, who I know is waiting with his hand, um, I would like to point out that in the chat, I see a lot of information sharing and resource sharing, which is great. I want to point out that all of the resources that are posted to the chat will be posted to the Slack afterwards so that they will continue to be available to people to access um, after the fact and to join in also with additional resources in our continuing discussion in that context. Eric, would you like to join jump in? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do feel uh, quite uh, strongly about uh, this topic, personalization and standardization, because uh, there are a lot of nuances with these two terms, right? It depends really on where they start, where they stop, what's the granularity and the resolution. For example, uh, you know, it's talking about Siri, for example. I think every individual on their iPhone has a personal Siri already because the way they use it is to train and further train the whole thing. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, this tool itself is not standardized yet you know, uh, uh, in the production on the next stage. Right? So, and don't forget that the science is also evolving. Today's problem may be automatically solved already you know, tomorrow. So I hope that we are defining issues and problems with a more, more, more kind of a longer horizon to kind of anticipate where science can come to a solution, you know, even before we have, uh, you know, a obsolete regulation on that. Now, regarding personalization in the healthcare space, I don't think there is uh, really a, 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 it's a necessity. No, not that it is a right or right, right or wrong, because every individual by definition is different. You know, we have the we all call the flu, and but the, our bodies are different. Ideally, we of course want a personalized treatment that is uh, suit for our body, our environment, our dietary, our condition. The way the reason it didn't happen is because we didn't know how to do it, or we don't have enough resource or devices or or measurements and so forth. So I think that's something that is. Uh, uh, destined to happen, especially with uh, the arrival of this uh, very customizable, fine-tunable, and uh, retrainable large models, foundation models. So here, I guess the standardization probably will be stay behind the stage in terms of uh, where building blocks, where computing, and where data are kind of uh, conforming into a certain form or rule, but uh, the offering and also, you know, uh, the uh, the adaptation probably can kind of go toward a different direction. That's where I, I, I see the trend. Now, going back to uh, trustworthiness and black box explainability, all this has been used uh, by both parties to argue for their position, you know, need or not to need. Here's my take. I think at the end of the day, it's all determined by priority and necessity. You know, for a dying person on the bed, and uh, you have a doctor coming to you, apply you a operation or a medicine, you'll probably care less about uh, the full explanation of the bi biology and mathematics and everything to you, you choose to trust. And also, if you look at uh, all the buildings and the historical artifacts, you know, there are pyramids and all this stuff, you know, uh, it was built before we know physics, mechanics and anything. People actually in history, even now, keep using black box approaches to still build things when they need to do it. And the explainability and the rationalism, symbolism, in my opinion, is a higher level luxury. When it is possible, we of course pursue that. But before we really get there, it doesn't stop me from still making things happen. That's just the way civilization is working. I have a modern example, the vaccine, for example. When, when Louis Pasteur invented the vaccine, there is no knowledge about DNA. There is no knowledge about uh, protein. There is still the one germ theory of diseases. But the truth is that the invention of the, of the vaccine is based on rigorous scientific experiments, which are repeatable, very robust, and unpredictable up to a particular level of uh, statistical measurement error. And uh, then even though we don't know the mechanics behind it, people use it and save lives, right? That's my attitude toward using foundation models, for example, for protein structure prediction and drug design. If 
you have empirical evidence showing that it is uh, up to a particular quality that is even better than, for example, the human crystal, uh, crystallography uh, determination structure, then I don't think there should be a problem using it, even though you don't necessarily know the fundamentals in the behind, because uh, the science will move. Today, you don't know it. Tomorrow, you can more people will be studying it. And the more output it generates, the more people will study it. Eventually, it will come to a conclusion. But I'm very, very concerned about people using a uh, kind of a, a cheap shot, I would say. Um, OK, your thing is not acceptable. Therefore, you shouldn't do it. That's not a very constructive way you know, of uh, pushing for a science uh, you know, investigation or even for a policy agenda. Yeah, I um, I resonate with your idea that uh, writing something off is is not productive, and yet I I hear a consistent theme. Correct me if I'm wrong. Under your arguments that you believe you have this implicit faith that when we act together, that the way that we interact with things as humans acting together leads to a good. Uh, result in the end. And I might just be a little bit less uh, trusting of that. Um, one example I will raise is, um, well, we we use human uh, intelligence as kind of the gold standard. We are thinking, you know, uh, now we're starting to see this behavior that looks to us a bit human-like in some ways. And so, um, which we're, you know, in awe and somewhat fear of, um, but we're, we trust, you know, the, the ways that we have interacted in the past um, in other settings and say humans adapt to these other things, we can adapt to this as well. But in medicine, when it comes to diagnosis, it's constantly a challenge that each person in some sense is a unicorn, that we learn things about diseases and yet there are comorbidities. And there's a problem in the social structure around medicine that there are specializations and that things fall through the cracks. And I wonder the extent to which, you know, just because people trust their doctor anyway, and somehow people get treated and most people get better, means that there isn't a danger here that somehow these issues uh, about specializations and unicornism, <laughs> to coin a phrase, um, you know, how will they rear their, their head in, in this context? And as a broader question then, um, on the tension between standardization and personalization, how do we know the difference between complexity and noise? And how will these models be able to navigate that space? Be, you know, No matter how much data we have, will they be able to make the choice about a unicorn um, in this, in the face of you know a unique set of comorbidities, I can see that Dennis has his hand. He wants to to jump in. Um, go right ahead, Dennis. So I, I I love the question that you posed there, and I think that a lot of this, to me, the questions of bias and equity, the questions of standardization, personalization, as well as the sort of practical dealing with the the, expl the explainability problem, come down much more to questions of data than of technology that it's it's much more to me i see it much more as about you know what we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze something in the world we're trying to analyze complex biological systems we're trying to analyze what's going on with a human being and in an infinitely complex human being in the world and the way that we do that is by taking that situation and turning it into data and that involves decisions about what we think is important and how we want to represent it, what we think is important, what we want to me what we measure, and then how we want to represent it. And each of those steps, I think, is where you have the potential for bias and inequities coming up. Did some work, uh, so so I have some recent work looking at the design of AI related to disability and showing that if you have just like an information extraction, you know, NLP toolkit that's fairly straightforwardly designed, but you define disability in different ways, which people do, you end up with very different kinds of information and totally incompatible uses of the exact same technology. And so I think for me, in the, the kinds of questions about standardization and personalization, well, you know, to, to Rada's point earlier about like, you know, do you want to personalize to an individual? Do you want to personalize to a community? How do you want to represent the kinds of things that you want to be sensitive to in the data that you have a system work with? 
Because if you don't have that representation of what you want to be sensitive to, the differences you want to be sensitive to, then no technology is going to be able to get that. So only then does it become a technological problem when you know that you have it in the data. But getting those data are always going to in, require imposing specific perspectives. Other comments? Eric, you still have yourself unmuted. Oh, Akanksha has her hands up. Akanksha, and then if Eric wants to respond. Yeah, um, so I really, really like Danny's point, and I kind of wanted to build on top of that, because I also strongly believe that a lot of these inequalities and inequities actually come from our data. And one of the things that we've been thinking about recently is if you think of large language models as an information source, especially um, as like providers of medical information from medical literature, et cetera, we know that clinical trials are biased. Uh, they don't cover all demographics. They don't cover all gender identities equally. So certain treatments that work for specific, that work have only been shown to work for specific populations. And we don't know how all these kinds of inequities are actually being represented in the information that the language model thinks it has because they don't really understand this kind of nuance. So I really want to strongly echo that point that we need better auditing of the data that we are feeding into these language models and a better understanding of how it's actually interpreting all of this data. And there's also another um, point I had, which comes from this, which is kind of building on this assumption that healthcare is collaborative. It is inherently a collaborative process, but even within that process, I think there are often tensions between the different stakeholders, like patients might not always trust their clinical providers. Um, there are also other, uh, so one example that I was thinking of recently is the maternal health setting, where there are non-clinical providers like doulas, for example, and they may not necessarily always have the same level of trust with clinical providers and vice versa. So when language models are brought into these kinds of settings where the process is collaborative, but maybe the collaboration is not as smooth as we expect it to be. What happens and how do people deal with these kinds of tensions? And what, who and what do they trust to be able to use language models? I think that's a really interesting question. I, I would love to hear people's thoughts. Yeah, that's that's so great, Akanksha, uh, because I think that um, it raises an issue that became even more an issue with the internet and, and the availability of a lot of medical information online, but now maybe even more that patients, on the one hand, feel empowered to go out and get information, but it changes the nature of their relationship with the doctor. And now there's maybe even a bigger issue that they might feel like they can trust even more that they go out to some chat GPT to get information, even if they correctly view it as just an information source. Now it's given them information. Now they're taking that into their doctor's appointment. And how is that going to change the dynamic uh, between doctors and patients? I haven't heard doctors comment on that yet, but I wonder if any of you in your own spheres have that you want to comment on that or, or where you see that going. <laughs> Let me share my funny experience on that. You know, I okay. always go uh, because my wife is, uh, you know, a, a very, very uh, kind of cautious person and always wanting to verify, you know, whatever recommendation from doctors. So she would use uh, Google, not ChatGPT before, basically to get uh, actually her necessary treatment. And the, the goal to go to doctor is to get a prescription from doctor so that she can actually place the order. That's kind of a very weird relationship because the doctor isn't really the source of uh, the treatment in presence of uh, a good way of uh, Googling information. I think uh, the utility of ChatGPT could be something like that. It basically gives uh, the patient an option that uh, they you know, uh, have access to the same knowledge that the doctor has. In fact, maybe even greater knowledge because ChatGPT obviously can have access to millions of patients, of course, uh, anonymized. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question in the future, how the medical practice dynamics, you know, will uh, exist or will evolve, you know, in light of this. But I think that's not a, the end of the world because the medical practice, you know, uh, even the current uh, bar assist, bar assistance and the examination is actually just a hundred years old. It's not not like a a a, a set thing, right? Uh, it will be interesting to see things co-evolve. But my general belief is that, you know, people 
when having more knowledge next to them, they, they are empowered instead of uh, being, you know, uh, decapitated, you know, uh, deactivated or, you know, uh, you know, negatively impacted. Product. I can add to that um, from interactions that I had with clinicians. I mentioned that briefly um, early on. What I've been hearing is that to the extent that generative AI will offer, say, the same value as up to date, which is the Google that clinicians use, they will probably not use it. Like, why would you switch tools when you are already used to one particular tool? So really, what I'm hearing is that the value would come from being able to make of that knowledge, make use of that knowledge in interesting ways. So for instance, uh, something that, again, I'm just quoting colleagues um, in the medical school is differential diagnosis generation. So given, say, some symptoms, make suggestions for things to consider, something that you wouldn't even consider in the first place. So maybe it would be a little bit like Eric's wife going on Google and getting some ideas for things to bring, uh, bring up, but that could be for the clinicians themselves. So when they see a patient, maybe you think of possible diagnosis A and B, and these tools would also say, why not also consider C, D, and E? And maybe you end up ruling D and E, but C would stand up there as a actual option. So going in the space of more creative generation um, has a lot of use that will go beyond just pulling out existing knowledge that you prompt with very concrete queries, which is how they use up to date right now. Uh, Dennis, it looks like you want to jump in. Yeah, just to respond to the, the differential diagnosis idea, I think that's that's a great example of sort of using the fact that these are statistical models for for exactly their purpose that like you know differential diagnosis is such a difficult problem always and it's such a it's also a, a lot of labor for clinicians and and not everyone likes to do it and so you know being able to kind of take take some sort of description about what's going on with the person now recognizing you'd have to do this in a way where you have information security so just you know saying that but taking this sort of description and going to a large language model and saying, well, tell me what kinds of things this sounds like. You're then asking a large statistical model to give you a statistical distribution of things that this might be. And I think that's that's an exactly the kind of really like creative use case where large language models, generative AI in general, thinking about like image generation as well, you know, that that has a lot of potential for that sort of case where it's not about I want to make one symbolic decision about what is right. It's about tell me what this might be. Yeah, I, I hear a lot of issues coming up. There's like an intensification of the need for information literacy. Um, there's still that tension between um, personalization and generalization, where a huge concern of, you know, Eric's wife is not unusual, actually. Many people do that strategy, but a lot of the advice on the web is very standard and doesn't take into consideration a person's specific comorbidities or personal characteristics and that's a danger um you know there's then how are we navigating this space and how will that change the nature of medical decision making and and uh, uh, one uh, additional um uh, implication that was raised in the chat is then who's legally responsible you know so where where is that that legal responsibility um coming into all of this so i think there are big questions and i think i agree with eric um earlier statement that you know we're in the first shock phase of you know there's been a lot of hype about this particular advance and it's changing people's thinking about how they're relating to the world we haven't settled yet, but we will. Uh, will we settle in a good place? Eric believes that that we will. I hope he's right. Um, I'd like to believe that. Um, but I think that you know we need to be aware that this is not just a technology thing. I think we're we're bringing in those that social um, aspect of all of this that I think is really important as as we consider the future. Let me just um, bring up some other questions that have been raised. Um, by the uh, audience, either before or during. Um, and um, so one, one question actually related to this is 
Um, where will be the real locus of change? Is it residing in the companies that are pushing the, the technology's uh, boundaries? Is it going to be a policy that really changes the landscape of how this plays out over time? Is it about those, you know, corner conversations while you're standing uh, by the grocery store and in line to buy something? Where do we think the real locus of change is in this landscape? And, and therefore, where is the responsibility, the primary responsibility where all this will land? Dennis, it looks like you want to jump in. I mean, I'd, I'd say it's everywhere. <laughs> like all of, all of the things that you just, like all the situations you just listed, all the groups you just listed, I think will be low sci for change. You know, it, 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 I think trying to say like one group or one situation will push the change forward the most is, is overly reductive because, you know, medicine and public health are so massively like multi-stakeholder settings. And it's about the, the exchange of information. It's about the exchange of trust between all these different people. You know, we've talked about that at, at many different points. And so I think that the change, like changes will come from conversations with patients, with their doctors and asking about like, how are you using AI in my in this practice? It will come from insurers trying to put in policies about AI use. It will come from, you know, researchers using AI and like developing better AI tools. I think it's going to, and it'll certainly come through like regulatory practices as well. You know, the FDA's, there was a note in the chat about this, like the FDA is starting to figure out how, how to try to regulate AI tools in health, you know, health and medicine settings. So it's kind of going to be everywhere all at once, I think. May I make a, uh, Go right ahead, a slightly, slightly crazy uh, kind of uh, speculation, I would say, because, yeah, as you said, you know, uh, as Dennis just said, you know, the every law size is changing. And, uh, but uh, if we were to, if I were to speculate a single part of changing that can be really exciting and uh, call for a uh, almost like an overall community action or attention, I would make the following speculation. And uh, look at uh, what paradigm shift brought by Isaac Newton, you know, when he wrote the book of a principle of Mathematica. That's kind of a, a new way of look at the world and a new methodology of study data and the natural phenomena because now you have calculus and you have a whole new set of tools you know, comparing to maybe Euclidean geometry or other things, right? So I want to ask, are we finally at the junction of a, a new tool, which could be foundation model or something that is available uh, and also developing that allow us to look at the world and the study our problem in a fundamentally different way? I start to feel that, to be honest, okay? Because I used to do many years of uh, old school biology in the lab then I do computational biology within statistics and the small programs. And uh, I never felt such a shock wave you know, after the AlphaGo and also the recent foundational models for protein and uh, the genomic perturbation study, you know, cellular embedding and the modeling. It's completely different, even ideologically and philosophically, in terms of how data are processed. It's about consuming you know, a overabundance of all your data without even cleaning them. Noise is also information. And then you have your architecture in the form of uh, multiple different attention mechanisms, multiple layers of a transformer, which is the embedding and the geometry, some manifold discovery, and then doing diffusion in the latent space. That's a new set of tools that we didn't use before. And uh, that's actually, to me, very exciting, whether to refute it or to prove it, right? Uh, I, I would uh, make a speculation at uh, a change, what happened in this particular low side, because uh, one way or the other, either you reject this, disprove it, or you prove it, will actually change the way we do science in the next 10 years. So as we are coming to the last 10 minutes of this meeting, I want to reserve a little bit of time for just some announcements, including how people can get involved in the Slack. I saw that there was a question about that um, in, the, in the chat, um, but I want to give each of our panelists the option um, to make one, conclude, one final concluding comment from their perspective. Uh, so I will circle through them. Um, 
and I'm going to I'm going to count that last comment you made as, as your final comment, Eric, and move on to Debbie. Thank you. Oh dear, the pressure's on. I mean, I think that I think that AI can be a transformative force in medicine and public health, but it re it really is about how do we think about integrating the affordances that these tools offer, the kinds of ways to work with data and work with information in ways that we could not do before, to work with greater volumes, greater diversity of information, and bring that into the ways that we are doing medicine, doing public health now. I think thinking about what AI can do in terms of better data and better information, that I think is, is the route to change. Anakonksha. Yeah, um, I think the main thing for me that a lot of people on this panel have also highlighted is trying to get as many voices into the building of these AI models as possible, whether it's from different demographics, uh, whether it's from different stakeholders in the process. I think trying to move towards a more participatory design process for all of this is going to be a very, very important uh, route, especially for a field as critical as medicine. And then. Okay, so yeah, I, I did this discussion are very inspiring. So, so basically, uh, yeah. So, so as someone who work in this natural science uh, domain, especially life science domain, right? So, so we we accept that, that, that this living organism, right, it has a uh, maybe infinite uh, dimensions of aspects, and that's why we uh, and, and that, right that the data and the aspects that we are able to uh, observe at this moment are just a, a very tiny portion. That's why, uh, and and this foundation models right and this generative ais that will provide us uh, for example the fusion of this uh, existing observed data and uh, and uh, observed aspect and hopefully bring us to new aspects and we we are always with open to uh, looking at uh, li this life phenomena from new aspects and uh, also, we are scientists and uh, and uh, keep uh, 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 curious and also critical and skeptical. Uh, it's our, our also mentality. That's why we uh, always try to uh, look at things from new ways and observe things and then uh, rethink about them. And then hopefully uh, it could bring us the more deeper understanding of the subjects that uh, we are studying. Thank you so much, Min. And Radha, last but absolutely not least. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think we are at the juncture. Um, although people would generally think that we are moving very fast, keeping the big picture in mind where progress is accelerating. I actually think we are now at the plateau where we moved very quickly up to this point. We are now building a foundation and ready to launch again on another upward slope while using where we are right now for that other launch. And in that, I really think, which is what Akansha was also pointing to, it's very important for us as AI researchers to be humble, to not think that we know it all and will solve everyone's problems, to actually have everyone at the table, whether it's different demographics, it's different disciplines, different expertise, because it has such big impact. And I really think there is a lot of very positive impact that we can see um, if we do it right. That's very wise. And I'm so glad uh, to have those as some of our, our closing words. So next week, um, we will have an analogous panel and that will be on finance and economics. And so I hope that many of you will come and join us. And we have experts there, both from industry and academia uh, coming and talking along those lines. Um, Many of you have been um, sending your reflections after the fact, and those have been very valuable alongside of looking at the comments in the chat afterwards when I have more time to really chew on them. Um, so please um, go ahead and um, uh, uh, come to our bit.ly Gen AI Reflect um, link here and enter your reflections. And there will also be an opportunity on that form to indicate that you would like to join our Slack, we'll be very happy to welcome you on there. And as I mentioned, I will comb through all of the chat comments after the fact and post up 
all the resources to that Slack. And so if you want to be able to come back and look at those and also ones that were shared earlier and will be shared um, going forward, um, go ahead and sign up to be part of that Slack community. I'm sure you can find a way of configuring it that is to your taste in terms of you know, how you want to be updated about what's going on there. Uh, I'll mention one more time, our Certificate in Computational Data Science Foundations, which will launch in fall, because many people have indicated um, as they have expressed interest in being part of this community that they're coming in not as experts in data science or modeling or language models or language technologies, machine learning, any of that. Um, and this is an opportunity for anyone anywhere in the world to sign up to get three full uh, university level courses full of instruction in this area to really help you to get more actively involved in this space going forward. So that will be at bit.ly CMU CDS. Um, and um, I will hope to see you all next week. And again, here is um, the link that you can go to to sign up for the Slack or to offer your reflections on today's session, bit.ly Gen AI Reflect. And thank you again for coming. It was great to have you all part of the discussion. And I thank all of the panelists. It was it was really fun for me to have this opportunity to interact with all of you. See you Thanks, all. Caroline for organizing. Mm -hmm.